What is up, my bodyweight warriors, and welcome back to another podcast. Today, I'm very excited for our guest, and that is Dr. Jennifer Crane. I came across her on Instagram as Circ Physio, if you do not know. I was very impressed by the content. Every time I saw a post, I felt like I was being taken to school, learning something new, and often some very interesting techniques. Jen is actually a physiotherapist. She's also an athletic trainer. She's a certified orthopedic specialist and an author. She's also recently worked with the Chinese Olympic teams in preparing for Rio 2016. So she's kind of a badass, knows her stuff at a really high level. But the most awesome thing about this is she takes all of this knowledge and it's very specifically applied to circus and performing arts. So we have extreme ranges of motion like the splits, like back bending. There's also hand balancing in there. Today, she's gonna share with us a whole wealth of knowledge when it comes to mobility, flexibility, all sorts of stuff. Loads of goodies in this podcast. As always, guys, links are in the description or the show notes, depending on where you're listening to this on YouTube, iTunes, or wherever. But I'm going to leave that intro there that kind of says it all. I'm going to get straight into the conversation now. So enjoy. Podcast time. <laughs> what is up, Warriors? Welcome back to the Bodyweight Warrior podcast. Today, I am honored, as I'm sure you've already heard, to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Crane. She is a physiotherapist and has a passion for circus, circus arts, hand balancing, all of that cool stuff. So hopefully we're going to dive into some really interesting topics covering mobility, flexibility, hand sand and everything else in between. So stay tuned. Um, thank you, Jen, for joining me today. It's an honor to have you on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So I guess for the people who don't know much about you, maybe the best place to get started would be just to share how you got to this point today. Uh, and just give a little bit of a background and why you have this passion for circus arts. That'd be great to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I guess my professional background, I'm a physical therapist and an athletic trainer. Um, early in my career, I started out working with athletes um, in kind of the mainstream sports, uh, football, soccer, tennis, volleyball. Um, and then as I kind of progressed in my career and um everything just kind of kept evolving. I myself discovered circus arts and hand balancing and acrobatics and aerial arts. And then as I kind of got deeper into that personally, I realized that there were there was just this huge lack of qualified sports medicine professionals who understand what we have to do with our bodies. Since it's so wildly different, even from like gymnastics and dance, mm -hmm. we're so unique. So um, with my background and experience in athletic training, working with athletes, um, and then also in physio, I felt like I had I was in a unique position where I understood firsthand the demands of what these athletes require of their bodies, and then professionally I understand what's going on on a more um, biomechanic level. So I I just decided that that was kind of where I was meant to be working, at, um, and I loved it. I mean, it's such a unique population of athletes that. It's just been a blast to be able to be a little bit more creative with, um, from a physio perspective than, than normally you're able to. Yeah. So that's how I arrived here. <laughs> that's awesome. I guess the sort of the problems that you come across because you're dealing with that more extreme end than your average day. So personally, DM with is probably a little bit more interesting. Um, as I mentioned in the instruction to this, uh, you were working with the Chinese Olympic team a, over in just in preparation for Rio 2016. Could you give a little bit more information about what you were helping them out with and what you were doing over there? Yeah, absolutely. So I was there um, for about eight months leading up to Rio. Um, I worked with a number of the of the Olympic teams over there. I was primarily with uh, diving and weightlifting, and then kind of went with other teams as needed. Um, if someone needed um, a physio to travel with them to a to a competition or a game or anything like that. Into that, but yeah, I was mostly with diving and weightlifting, and it was just such a bizarre and awesome and very unique experience um, to see not only that level of athletes and kind of how that differs from more recreational athletes or even professional athletes in America, um, and then also the cultural difference too, because there are some pretty extreme cultural differences not only um, in lifestyle but also in training approach. So to have that with my um, Western medicine physio brain and then to be met with some, some different thoughts over there was really, it was a cool growth experience for me to kind of expand um, 
kind of how I typically treat and approach injuries. That's really interesting. Is there anything that particular that, or anyone that particularly inspired you to get into the circus arts uh, or in that field rather than like the more traditional sports background? Um, you know, I don't think so. I think um, it was just a matter of me doing it and then kind of experiencing, you know, in my body what it felt like to start as an adult in all of this, these type, this types of athletic endeavor and be like, ooh, yeah, like I'm feeling some different muscles. I'm feeling some different things. And then thinking about with my PT brain, like, oh, what's going on at a more kind of regional biomechanic level? So it was really more of like a personal, um, like I'm experiencing all of this. And if I weren't a PT and I had to go to a PT for this, it would be so hard for me to explain like, okay, so I got hurt doing like a reverse meat hook or something like that. The PTs would just look at you and be like, what? <laughs> so I think I saw it as an opportunity to kind of just provide something that wasn't, wasn't already super readily available for most people. Yeah, definitely. You're absolutely right there. Um, so it's something you got into later, right? You didn't do any sort of previous gymnastics as a child or anything like that. It was kind of just something that you'd found later on in life. I did that and I danced growing up. So I have that performing arts background. I did a little bit of gymnastics, but air awareness and tumbling has just never, ever been a strong suit of mine. So, um, but yeah, I didn't do any, any aerial or any circus growing up. So I got into that um, a couple years after I was um, a practicing PT. Um, and then I transitioned from being a distance runner to an aerialist. So <laughs> That was a really unique uh, couple months in my life, but um, yeah, it's it was uh, definitely a transition in my adulthood, and then working more on flexibility and strength that I hadn't ever had before. Yeah. So, so I guess uh, talking about flexibility, I don't know if, if you guys haven't seen Jen on Instagram or any of the stuff that she posts. Like Jen is crazy flexible, um, <laughs> just kind of like leg up by your head, kind of. You know, what you'd imagine, full splits, everything. Um, wh were you always a flexible person? Is that something that came naturally to you? Yeah, you know, I think that it does, flexibility does come easier for me than strength building. So I think typically there, there are many different body types, but they're, if we break it down really simply, they're the people who, who tend to, be, to gain flexibility a little easier and people that tend to gain strength a little bit easier. And I definitely fall into the first category. Um, Growing up, I mean, I was never the most flexible dancer, but I had my splits um, and then worked kind of moderately hard at backbending, which has never also been my strong suit. But um, yeah, I, I'm definitely more naturally flexible than strong. Okay. And so it's interesting you mentioned that. I know it's something that I've definitely come across with working with people. Do you know or do you have any reasons why that might be, why people are more tended to more flexibility or strength? Um, I'd be interested to hear your insight on that. Yeah, I think there are a lot of factors that go into that for sure. Um, first, I would say genetics definitely plays a role. Um, there are different schools of thought on this, and I think research is always evolving in this category. But um, you know, some researchers have even kind of isolated a few different, like what they call flexibility genes. Um, so I think that that's really interesting. That you know, if you have this gene, you are more likely to have more extensive connect or um, elastic connect connective tissue and um, also you're apparently less good at endurance sports, but less likely to get tendonitis. So I think that that's really an interesting, that's um, interesting. kind of find in, on the genetic front. Um, so, so genetics definitely plays a role. And then I think even almost beyond genetics, what you do growing up really plays a role in that. So like if you grow up playing soccer or, um, running or cycling, then that's, those aren't sports that require you to be in any extreme ranges of motion. And then as your body develops and grows, um, our, our joints and bones and muscles kind of form in the direction of stress we place on them in our, uh, in our youth and adolescence. So if you don't put that stress on your body, then it's just going to be a little bit harder to acquire that in adulthood. Not that you can't, but it's, it's just, you know, you don't have that kind of pre-existing set. Um, so, so yeah, what you do growing up really matters. Um, and then how you train, of course, makes a huge difference in flexibility, but a lot of, a lot of moving, moving parts in that for sure. That's definitely very interesting. I can see how that, you know, it's, it's very interesting how this early life, 
uh, experiences can affect you so much later on down the line. So, I mean, you, you kind of touched on there, like how people use their range of motion. Obviously, like you're a runner, there's limited in really what you require. Where do you sit on that? Because I know, obviously, you deal a lot with circus arts, contortionists, which is definitely on the extreme end of flexibility, like putting themselves in ridiculous positions. Um, where do you see sort of flexibility standing? Do you see it's, you know, is there a basic level of flexibility you think most people should have, or is it going to depend on person to person? Obviously, I mean, not everyone's going to need to be able to do middle splits, but where yeah. do you kind of stand on that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I mean, it just depends on what you do and what you want to do with your uh, with your body and the activities that you do throughout your, your normal week. So if you're a runner, I mean, certainly you need a base level of muscle extensibility to be able to run and kind of do normal activities. But definitely you don't need, if you're a runner, there's no reason for you to be working on splits or metal splits if you have no desire to also do anything in performing arts or requiring flexibility. So um, I think there's a, been a, a longstanding myth that stretching will reduce injury just like across the board. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, I think that if you are in a sport or an activity that requires a lot of flexibility and you either don't have that or you acquire that in a way that you only have passive flexibility and you're not strong at your end ranges of motion, that's an injury predictor. And then, you know, if you're a runner, you, there's no reason that you need all of that flexibility. You, um, I think actually some studies have shown that um, being a little bit like stiffer is actually beneficial in endurance sports like running. So that's very, it that's just depends what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of a question I wanted to ask you because I know you're very into injury prevention and recovery. So, and a lot of people do get into stretching. Though there is that kind of conception out there that you know, oh, I'll do a bit of stretching; it will stop me getting injuries or whatever. And obviously, they say there's not that much of a correlation. Um, but there is a correlation between sort of passive flexibility and active flexibility. So if you were to looking to stretch to prevent injuries, would you then sort of favor, I guess, mobility training rather than like passive flexibility stretching? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there, and that's kind of another misconception in the flexibility training world that to get more flexible, you just have to like sit in a passive stretch and hold it for like five minutes. Um, and that's not beneficial. I mean, I think that there is a time and a place for more static stretching. But even when you're doing like a long, like a 60 second hold, you should never be fully relaxed in a stretch. It's always like, what muscles are you thinking about engaging? Am I engaging my quads, my glutes, um, my hips? What am I, what am I actively engaging to create not only flexibility and to be able to get into this extreme posture, but what muscles do I need to stabilize and be strong here so that when I do this, in um, you know, in your main um, apparatus or sport, so that you're not just kind of slamming into that passive flexibility and hoping that it goes well. Yeah, you actually yeah. are purposeful about building strength around that range of motion. Yeah, that's really interesting. So when you when you find yourself training flexibility, I mean, obviously you're more extreme. So you, you kind of you're sticking mostly in that active active flexibility. There's all these words that get thrown out, all these buzzwords, but kind of you're never just chilling out and relaxing and completely passive in a stretch. You're always kind of thinking about what's happening, what's being activated and doing PNF or active range of conditioning, whatever it is, is that kind of where you fall rather than just straight passive stretching? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's fair to say. I always, I mean, ideally sometimes, you know, I get lazy and then need to be cued by my contortion instructor. Like, Oh, like engage your quads. What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. But, um, but yeah, I, I, ideally you're never just relaxing into a stretch. It's always something that you're either working on strengthening and active flexibility where you are um, using the muscles surrounding the joint to move that joint through a, as full of a range of motion as you can against gravity or you're doing you know, what could be considered a passive stretch if somebody were to look at you just holding a split. Um, but act actually, you know, you're really working to engage all of the muscles that you need to to keep yourself safe in that split. So, so yeah, I think it's definitely a combination of a lot of things, but I'm never just like chilling in the stretch. Okay, that's really interesting. So, you kind of mentioned that it's a bit of a misconception that stretching necessarily reduces the risk of injury. What would you recommend then to reduce the risk of injury? I know this is kind of a vague question, but like if stretching doesn't, then what would you say is a good uh, alternative? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, again, it depends on what you want to do. If we're assuming that you want to do something that requires flexibility, 
Um, so whether it's something in performing arts, circus arts, or kind of this body weight training calisthenics, um, figure out, you know, what your goals are and what range of motion and flexibility you want in your, like, what's your goal. And then figure out how to do that in an active way and how to strengthen in that position. So, um, the one huge injury predictor that I see in kind of the circus arts acrobatics world is a huge gap between active and passive flexibility. So for example, if you're in, if you're doing like a split on the ground, if you have like just a crazy, like crazy high over split on the ground, but when you're in a handstand in a split, you, it's like pizza slice, right? So that's a huge injury predictor because that can, from that you can infer that, oh, you have all this passive range of motion, but your body doesn't know how to support yourself in that position. So that's really when injuries happen, when you have a ton of passive flexibility, but you don't, you can't control that with your muscles and your body. Okay, that's really interesting. So I guess kind of more the people who would end up in maybe what you'd class as like hypermobile. So, so a lot of a lot of passage range and not much resistance, uh, mm-hmm. and not much control over that range of motion. Okay, that's very that's very interesting. Um, and as I mentioned, you're you're obviously a specialist when it comes to rest and recovery. That's something you're very interested in, which is something that I've learned over being, <laughs> making mistakes and from training that it is pretty important. Um, and it maybe it's, it's something that's not as sexy or cool as like go hard every day in the gym. And smash it. Um, and I know I've, I think I've seen somewhere that you recommend taking one week off every eight weeks. Is that right? Yeah, that's kind of my my first frontline approach to tackling this um, the monster of recovery in this realm. Um, yeah, it's it's hard because this is definitely the least popular conversation that I have with everyone in this circus world is okay we don't have an on and an off season so that means that we need to build this in and you need to really kind of think about phasing your training program and this is something that's even like in the um, body weight and powerlifting world I think people understand like you can't lift heavy every day for three months and be okay. Like there's going to be, you have to build in like deloading weeks and um, recovery weeks and then weeks that you really ramp up and go hard. We don't really do that in circus. And so the, like just starting to have this conversation of, okay, like just bringing out those differences and then saying, okay, so you can see how there's potentially a problem if you're training seven days a week for six months without like any full, break or deloading or change in your training, um, that's a huge injury predictor too. So, so yeah, my, my standard kind of the first easiest thing that I suggest for most circus artists and athletes in general who don't have seasons is if you are training with the, with the goal of acquiring strength or, um, or skills, if you're working on new skills, then for every six to eight weeks of training that you're doing, you should take a full week of recovery. Um, and that, that doesn't mean like a full week of bed rest. Like you're not just like laid out on your couch for a week watching Netflix. It's, you know, still be doing, you can be doing other things that are not your primary sport. So for aerialists and people who do mostly upper body or hand balancers, um, I tell them, okay, like go take a dance class, take a ballet class, go for a walk, ride a bike, like go for a hike, do something with your legs. Um, (laughs) like you need your legs you do need your legs even though you're an aerialist um so that's that's kind of my first recommendation and then of course if I'm working with someone one-on-one we kind of break it down a little bit more um I'll like work with their coaches and kind of talk about how like from my perspective like I would love to see a little bit more variety week to week versus doing the same thing every week for months um it's a huge topic and one that doesn't make me a very popular person when I talk about it, but it's really important, especially in this world. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, um, I, th- I do think that's a very interesting thing with like recreational sports people is like, if you're a professional sports person, then you do have those seasons. You have an off season, you have an on season, like it, it changes hugely. And then when you're recreational and you're just training because it's part of your life, you just, just go regardless. And, Ultimately, you know, you're not supposed to just go hard all the time. Um, so th- definitely, you know, that's a really great point, just taking a week off every six weeks. And it's, it's hard as well because, you know, obviously the reason people do train is because 
they really like training so telling them that they can't do something you know it's a, it's a hard mental thing to get over but you kind of got to just take your medicine with that one i really like that advice that's great uh, i've got a couple of quick fire questions i wanted to throw at you um favorite exercise slash stretch whatever you want to go with that's yeah um that's a good question i think generally and if like you follow me on instagram or people who like know are a little bit more familiar with my kind of approach i love exercises in like a modified child's pose um so whether it's for shoulder mobility so in a child's pose lifting your arms up um or working on glute strength from there um a lot of what i find in this realm of bodyweight training circus arts is that we cheat with our low back muscles for everything. Our low back muscles want to kick in all the time and take over. And then some of the smaller like shoulder stabilizers or our glutes as a result will kick back and be like, oh, okay, you got us back. You got us low back. We don't need to do much. Um, so, so in a modified child's pose, you really can't cheat you because you're in this like chunk flexion. You can't it's much harder for your low back to kick in and, um, and kind of take over. So that's a position that I do a lot of what I kind of have termed end range control exercises, which is that last bit of active flexibility that tends to be really hard. Um, so that's a position that I do that I use a lot in um, in training with circus artists and um, especially actually with lift like power lifters and Olympic lifters. That's huge because that you need such an extreme shoulder range of motion for that that if you're cheating completely with your low back and just arching to get to achieve that like overhead position, you're, you're going to have a back injury at some point. So, um, so I like anything in a modified child's pose. That's really interesting. And for everyone who doesn't know what a child's pose is, essentially when you're kneeling on the floor and you just kind of fold forward face to the floor, um, just for those who are listening and maybe don't have the, the visual representation there. Now, it's actually a really interesting recommendation. Um, least favorite exercise slash stretch. Personally, um, I've always hated middle splits, like with every fiber of my being. So I just, it's not that they're, yeah, they're good. I need to work on it. It's a beneficial thing. It's a kind of standard flexibility measure in performing arts, but it's just something that I never, ever look forward to. I'm always like, oh, really? Do I have to? <laughs> I can definitely attest to that. Oh, it is one of the like most humbling exercises to have to do. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it, like it never gets easier as well. Like it just always yeah. sucks. And it just it's really slow progress, and you're like, when will this happen for me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, proudest training slash coaching achievement. Um, yeah, I would say probably watching the the Olympics this in 2016 was the most like surreal and kind of proud moment I think I've had um especially watching the diving team I worked pretty closely with the diving team and they're the best in the world they totally killed it they got I think nine of the ten gold medals um so just watching them in all of their um all of their events I like I'm pretty sure I was more nervous than they were like I was just on my couch like I couldn't be around anybody I was just like watching really anxiously so um but it was amazing it was really cool to see um so that was so that was awesome Damn. awesome um finally biggest training inspiration so what, what inspires you on kind of a day-to-day -day basis to, to train move do what you do um i don't you know i don't know if i have like one or like a few in particular training inspirations um i think i'm always really inspired by people who like you're we kind of talking about earlier, people tend to either be more naturally good at flexibility or strength. So when I see someone who is naturally like good at flexibility, really excelling in something strength based, like that's really inspiring because I'm like, okay, like you had to really work for every every tiny little accomplishment for that. So I always get really inspired by by anyone who can do that and can kind of push through all of the the initial everything sucks, everything hurts, um, loses, and and do really well and excel in that. So I think that that's those are the type of people that I get really inspired by. Oh, awesome, awesome answer. Um, cool. So I want to jump back in to some mobility stuff and something yeah. that when I came across you, you actually made me invest in, and that is a peanut. So <laughs> for the people who don't know, a peanut is two basically two lacrosse balls and they're kind of like sandwiched together. So you get 
it's, it's, it's a soft tissue tool. You can use it for lots of stuff, but it's not very fun. It's probably how the best way I can describe it. Um, why do you like the peanut so much? Why is that like up there in your soft tissue tool kind of uh, toolkit? Yeah, um, I, I like the peanut because I don't like carrying a lot of things in my backpack with me. Um, so a lot of people kind of walk around with like a foam roller and like a, like a big softball for mobility and like four lacrosse balls. Um, and I, and I kind of like to try to minimize as much as possible. So I found that everything, every kind of soft tissue mobility exercise you can do with the lacrosse ball or a foam roller, you can do with a peanut, but not, you can't like everything you can do with a peanut, you can't do with like a lacrosse ball. So it's kind of a space saver for me. And then a lot of things like for, I use it a lot for upper back mobility, which is something that everyone struggles with. I mean, most people have like I, a I've been there. I still am there. Yeah, right? It's just like, ugh, upper back is so, so stubborn. So you can do a lot of great things with the peanut for upper back mobility that you can't do with a lacrosse ball. So that it's kind of my go-to tool for that reason. But um, certainly, I mean, like two lacrosse balls and a sock works great. You can, there are a lot of variations on the peanut, <laughs> but I like the, the different things that you can do with a peanut that you can't necessarily do with a foam roller or a lacrosse ball. Okay. So for, for example, just to, to throw out, would there be like kind of a T-spine mobilization throwing the peanut kind of in that mid-back arching over, kind of working more segmentally rather than the foam roller, I guess you can't quite dig in as much. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a little bit more localized with the peanut. You can go a little bit more, like you were saying, at a segmental level. Um, and it's a little bit more intense. So often if somebody's really stiff and really tight, I'll start them off on a foam roller <laughs> until it's a little more tolerable and we'll progress to using a peanut. Um, but yeah, a lot of different tools for that. But I tend to uh, favor the peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so if say you didn't have a peanut um, and you couldn't just recommend that, is there any other tools that you would recommend that you think is useful for general mobility training or flexibility um, training? Sorry, like you're stuck on a desert island and have to make a peanut, or like what? <laughs> no, no. no. Okay. If, if the peanuts, peanuts are off the table, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, lacrosse balls are great. Tennis balls, um, a round piece of fruit literally like any anything that resembles a lacrosse ball is great um, i've had so there's a pt i can't remember who it was but recommended um like if you're traveling in, in a hotel you can take a pillowcase um and tie a knot in the middle and then that works kind of like a mobility point that you can use for things so i thought that that was fairly clever that's quite interesting. Um, but yeah you can definitely get creative with um different soft tissue mobilization tools uh, what about resistance bands? Are you a fan of using like the resistance bands, maybe more in the Kelly Sturette camp of like distractions and those sort of things? Are they something that you use regularly? Yeah, I really like the self mobilizations with the bigger super bands. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. I use that a lot for um, increasing mobility for middle splits, for um, for square splits, um, and for really just stubborn hips. I love super bands. That's one of my, like, if I could only take like three things with me, um, stranded on a desert island, <laughs> had to make flexibility. Um, a super band would definitely be one of the things that I would bring with me just because it's so useful. Like, I mean, Kelly Starrett has a great, like tons of YouTube videos on his, on his channel of different ways to use a super band for hip mobility, shoulder mobility. Um, and I've seen a lot of awesome improvements in flexibility with that. Okay. Uh, can you give us like a little bit more insight into why you use that? Do you use it to like create more space in the joint? Uh, maybe a couple of examples. I know it's hard to describe things and put things into words that we're talking about. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are a few different concepts behind the super band kind of hip mobilizations or joint mobilizations. Um, the first is that it does, the idea is that it creates a little bit more joint space. So for, for those of us that sit a lot, stand a lot, just generally have a lot of compression on our joints, this is a way that we can uh, use an outside tool to kind of create a little more space in the joint, even if it's just um, temporarily, to encourage some more synovial fluid, so all of the joint lubricating fluid to 
go and um, go into that joint space and give you a little bit better mobility within the ball and socket joint of your hip. Okay. Um, so that's one. That's one theory. Um, and then another another thing that I think it's useful for is when mobility is or when flexibility is limited by a joint capsule type tightness, which is the joint capsule is the fibrous connective tissue covering of the ball and socket joint. Um, oftentimes that will kind of get really tight if we sit a lot, if we, you know, whatever postures run a lot, we tend to, our body adapts and gets tight in that direction. Yeah. Um, so this is a way that you can go in and kind of target beyond the hip flexors for like, um, square splits for the back leg and splits. Um, you can get kind of beyond the hip flexors and into some of the deeper connective tissue structures that tends to limit flexibility. Um, so, so there are, there are all sorts of different kind of thoughts and rationale behind why this works. Um, and you know, in reality, it's probably a combination of all of that. And then, um, yeah, so, so that's why I like, I, I like the super band. I think it's, it creates some really nice within session changes and it seems to make middle splits stretching suck a little less, which <laughs> always is great. <laughs> I'll definitely give that a try. Um, so I want to move on to something that I don't know a lot about and I would really like to kind of dig your reins on a little bit and that is nerve flossing. So the so the kind of idea that obviously we talk a lot about muscles when we talk about flexibility, like you want to stretch your hamstrings, your hip flexors, etc. Uh, we don't necessarily talk about nerves and obviously they play an important part. Could you briefly explain to the people listening what nerve flossing is? and maybe some of the potential benefits and uses of using it. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of going back to that concept of there are a lot of different things that limit flexibility beyond just muscles. So we kind of talked about joint capsule, mm -hmm. um, stiffness and tightness, so that's one thing. And then nerve tension is also something else that's very common in um, limiting our pike stretch and then the front leg of our splits. Um, so our sciatic nerve is the biggest nerve in your body. It starts from your low back and then it goes um, goes down kind of in between your glute muscles, in between your hamstrings, down your calf to the bottom of your feet. So this is a structure that's very long. Um, and it's really like if you think about being in a pike with your feet flexed, that's the structure that tends to limit that position the most. Because if you go back to thinking about hamstring anatomy, our hamstrings attach on the bottom of our pelvis and then go and cross into our lower leg lower leg bones, they cross our knee and attach, um, attach there. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about just stretching our hamstrings. The only thing we need to really, the only position that we need to be in is, um, kind of anterior pelvic tilt and then leaning forward in a pike with our feet pointed. So foot position doesn't matter in a hamstring stretch, mm -hmm. um, because of where they attach. Right. But in, uh, if we're thinking about our nerve anatomy and we're in that pike with our feet flexed, if you feel a big difference in the sensation, in your pike with your feet pointed and versus flexed, really the main limiting structure there is your nerve. So what that means um, and why that matters, our nerves are not elastic like our muscles. So they don't like to be stretched the same way our muscles like to be stretched. If yeah. you pull a nerve from both ends and if it's already especially irritated, that's when you get that sciatica or this like really uncomfortable shooting pain down your leg. If you feel um, in your pike, if you ever feel your calves, that's, it's not your calves, it's a nerve. Um, so, so that's kind of when we want to think about nerves. Um, nerve mobility and what we want in an ideal world. Um, if you think about a nerve, so you have this big long nerve and it runs through a connective tissue tubing. So from where it exits your back mm -hmm. down to the bottom of your feet. So it's kind of like a cooked spaghetti noodle <laughs> and a straw. <laughs> Great analogy. So yeah, so that the spaghetti noodle needs to be able to move back and forth. There's like a, there's a normal range of like excursion that the noodle needs to be able to move in for us to have this, especially more extreme flexibility. So what can happen when we get nerve tension, which can happen for so many reasons, just from sitting too much or from, you know, doing a certain activity for most of our lives, for whatever reason you get nerve tension, which is basically when the spaghetti noodle gets stuck to the inside of the straw and then okay. it can't move, it can't have that like normal excursion. So nerve gliding is then, or nerve flossing is kind of the way that you stretch nerves um, that differs from muscles. So the idea with nerve flossing is that you would take the nerve and you put it on tension at one end, so you pull it tight at one end mm -hmm. while you mm -hmm. put it on slack at the other end and then you reverse it. So all of these, these nerve glides and nerve flossing are like really weird looking kind of stretches that 
kind of look funky, um, but they're meant to kind of unstick the spaghetti noodle from the straw so that you can have this normal range of motion. Okay, so is that, it's not, so you're not really stretching the nerve as such, you're just allowing it to move more freely throughout that connective tissue casing? Yeah, exactly. Okay, I mean, it's for me personally, I, I've, this year I've suffered with quite bad, like quite severe golfer's elbow, uh, and I actually did have a snapping tricep as well, one of my hands, and, and playing with that nerve flossing is something that really improved that sort of particular issue very, very quickly and helped a lot with just reducing general pain. Um, and it was it wasn't something I quite understood yet. I think it might, it might have been on your Instagram that I did see it originally, and I just sort of played a bit. And it's quite an interesting. It's not something. It's, as I said, it's just not something that most people talk about. Um, but it's very interesting you mentioned, especially with the hamstrings. Like a, a good test, just to reiterate what Jen said was about stretching your hamstrings with your feet pointed. Was it? Mm -hmm. And if you feel it in the back of your calves, then it's likely going to be nerve related or is it if you if you notice a difference between where your feet are positioned sorry yeah. yeah so if it's if you can stretch further with your feet pointed versus flexed and okay. if the sensation is different if in feet flexed you feel it like in your calf or in the bottom of your foot or anywhere besides your hamstring mm -hmm. then okay. you would think that you might need to or you might benefit from sciatic nerve uh, glides or flossing that's very, very interesting. And I guess the same applies to the upper body, especially for people who are doing a lot of hand balancing. Then it's mm -hmm. going to be the, the ulnar and median nerve, if I, if I uh, can remember. Is that going to be right? Is there something that you might want to do there as well? Is that going to have the same sort of impact? Yeah, absolutely. And like you're saying, with hand balancers, aerialists, um, anyone that gets kind of that medial elbow pain or the golfer's elbow tends to benefit or can often have uh, nerve mobility restrictions as well. So especially if you're really noticing that you're getting like tingling in your hands or like in the last few fingers or anything like that, any tingling, numbness, burning, A is not you should see a physio. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, good uh, point. Can be modified uh, and can be adjusted with, with nerve glides, which I really, like I really encourage everybody that is an upper body athlete to throw nerve glides into your general warm up just to do um on a fairly regular basis so that you kind of get ahead of that and, and don't have any nerve res uh, restrictions. Yeah, awesome. So, I mean, obviously, putting in the medical disclaimer, this is just <laughs> advice. Obviously, go seek uh, professional attention before trying any of these out. But if people did want to start, um, what, how should they do it? Because obviously, you said, you know, nerves don't want to be stretched, so maybe we don't want to be holding long passive holds. How might you go about uh, doing a little bit of nerve flossing to try this stuff out. I know you have a bunch yeah. of really great examples on your Instagram account, which if you're not following, you should be if you're listening to this podcast. But I'd love to hear a couple of examples from you if that's right. Yeah, so I mean, there are a million different nerve glides and there are different kind of variations and tweaks depending on what specific branch of the nerve you're trying to address. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, depending on what nerve glide you go with, the important thing to know when you're doing working on nerve mobility is that you don't want to push into it even like to a, you, you don't want to push through it. Um, and it should be kind of slower rhythmic movements. So whatever nerve glide you're doing, you want it to be like a slow rhythmic thing and you don't want to go, you want to feel the nerve tension. So like if we're talking about the ulnar nerve, you know, you, you will probably feel kind of something along here or maybe like, through your elbow when you're doing the glide, but it doesn't want to be, you don't want it to be super intense. If it's so intense that you're like, oh, this really, okay. Um, then your brain starts to send this panic signal to that nerve and then it tightens up all the muscles that the nerve innervates. So that's counterproductive, right? So this is one of those things that's hard to explain to circus artists, performing art artists, power lifters, yeah. people that tend yeah. to do a lot more like go, go big or go home. Yeah, this they're used to that pain. Yeah, so you don't want to push through pain. You want like a very moderate pull and then you want to back off of it and then you want to do like slow rhythmic movements like that. So if we're talking about the ulnar nerve, which is my favorite nerve glide because you kind of go like this, right? You kind of end up looking <laughs> like that. So that's like the ulnar nerve stretch. <laughs> um, so nerve guides for the ulnar nerve tend to be like, you know, you go here just until you start to feel it in your elbow. So maybe I'm here and then I back off. Um, so it's like a very small movement okay. and you don't want it to be, to push through a lot of pain. Yeah, really great advice. And so I think it's something that definitely is worth digging into for people. Obviously it's not something that gets chatted about a lot. 
Um, and it's something I'm very new to as well. I'm very interested in one of those things that's like on my radar at the moment. So thanks for explaining a little bit more about that. Um, one last question before you go, which is why I kind of seem to be asking everyone in these podcasts. Uh, if you had, I like to, on the YouTube channel and everything I do, I like to give people actionable advice, which is obviously something you do on your Instagram, something that you can take away and do and try and apply because otherwise, you know, what's the point? Um, if you can recommend one thing for people to try today, it doesn't have to be training related, it can be literally anything, what would you recommend people go and try and experience for themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think kind of going back to flexibility, since I assume that people who, um, you know, watch the podcast and kind of subscribe to your channel I mean, are working so. on flexibility. Um, yeah, I think that I would just say I would encourage them to, um, if you're working on splits, try to be active in it. So instead of just passively relaxing, engage your quads in the front leg, engage your glutes in the back leg, engage your low abs, and stay there for like 30 seconds or however long you're holding and just see how that feels in relation to completely relaxing. So I would just encourage people to be a little bit more actively engaged when they're working on flexibility um, and see what kind of changes that that affects. It tends to have a pretty uh, pretty big positive impact on carryover and flexibility um, and then also in injury prevention. So just be active in your stretch and don't just passively relax into it. I think that's a great bit of advice, actually. You know, it, it applies to everything. Obviously, as I mentioned, you're very prominent on Instagram. Is there anywhere else that people can go to find out more about you and learn more about, obviously, you've got a great depth of knowledge in this sort of, especially, as you said, most uh, physiotherapists don't have that kind of specific focus when it comes to advanced ranges of motion, like the front splits, the middle splits, square splits, sorry, back bending, et cetera. So where can people find out more about that and learn more, which is... Yeah, um, so I have a, my website has a blog section and I kind of break down a lot of these flexibility concepts, um, many things that are specific to aerialists or um, upper body athletes. Um, so that's a really good um, free resource that I just kind of talk about the anatomy, uh, biomechanics, and really try to break it down in uh, more digestible terms for those people who don't have a huge background in anatomy and movement and um, don't understand the big words and big terminology. So I really try to make it a little bit more accessible for everybody there. Um, that's a great resource. I have active flexibility plans um, that I sell on my website. So whether you're working on active flexibility and splits, middle splits, or upper back, shoulders, low back, hips, um, those are resources for ramping up active flexibility a little bit more safely and kind of do, um, they work on kind of what we talked about with end range control and active engagement and really like what you should be feeling in your, in your flexibility that is not ju that's beyond just passively relaxing into it. Um, and then I also have uh, online training, kind of comprehensive flexibility training with my business partner, Katie Breyer, who's a contortion coach here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. She's my contortion coach. She's the best. Um, <laughs> so we have a company together where we kind of are really just revamping what people, what we hope people think about with flexibility training. So it's a lot of strength building in these more uh, performing arts relevant positions of flexibility um, and then talking about really like diving into what you should be feeling when you're stretching your pancakes, stretching your middle splits, uh, square splits. So um, those are also great resources. Um, and then, yeah, Instagram, I have free advice every week. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so uh, if anyone is li listening and wants to find out more about Jen, everything will be linked in the description of this video on YouTube or it will be in the podcast notes on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever else you're listening to. Make sure you go check her out. I honestly, I've learned a lot from the short time that I've been following Jen. So it's been an honor to chat to you in a little bit more detail on this podcast. And I'm still going to be staying tuned and learning more. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you for sharing some of your wisdom. I guess it is right at the beginning of the day where you are now and the end of the day here. So have a great day. And thank you for joining me. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. See ya. <laughs>